All right, welcome back. We're gonna learn this stuff right here in this video, if I could find it. <laughs> here it is. Uh, we've looked at computers, how computers work, and we've looked at numeral systems, we've looked at measuring bits, and now we're gonna look at text, and we're gonna see the ASCII coding scheme, and we're also gonna see the Unicode coding scheme, and we're gonna see how Unicode can be encoded using UTF-8, which is variable length encoding. And so uh, that's what we're gonna see. And just to lay, oh, and then I'm gonna preview for you the code here. And so here's the code we're gonna look at right there. And then also you could pause the video and read that. And then also here is code we're gonna look at right here. And so you could pause the video right here and you could read this. And so that's just to give you a preview of what's coming. And if you wanna see this whole playlist, it's good to start at the beginning with it so you understand all of the fundamentals for what we've built up to with what we're gonna cover in this video. And to get to the first video on this playlist, the link is down below in the description <laughs> to the playlist, so go check it out. All right, so where to begin? Uh, the first thing to begin with is that we computers run on electricity. Electricity could be in on-off states. And depending upon if a switch, like a light switch on a porch on Halloween, is in an on state, it could mean one thing, come trick-or-treat. And if it's in another state, an off state, it could mean another thing, go away. So on Halloween, a light switch in on means come trick-or-treat. Off means go away, right? Like that's what the light switch, a circuit, a transistor in an on or off state can have a coding scheme represented, uh, connected to it. So if it's on, it means one thing. If it's off, it means something else. That's a coding scheme. Well, we have coding schemes for letters too, right? So we saw in that first video that we could have a coding scheme for random stuff like this. The zeros are offs and the ones are ons. Or we could have a coding scheme for, you know, letters just randomly created. In the early days of computers, like, you know, there was all these different coding schemes that were out there. And so one of the coding schemes that became the most popular was ASCII. And so if we had like, you know, eight uh, circuits, eight switches, eight transistors, in this arrangement of off and on and off, 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 all that, and then on, right, that was the letter A. And so in, in decimal, we saw that like this, and those were circuits or switches in on-off states. Uh, sorry, in binary, we saw it like that, but in decimal, we saw it as 65, right? But that's how the letter A was stored. And so we had this coding scheme for these letters, and, uh, and this was called ASCII. Well, this ASCII was, a, was only a, a one-byte coding scheme. It had eight bits. And so with eight bits, you could only go up to two to the power of eight, which is two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, <laughs> right? You could only store 256 things, which, you know, for, you know, our alphabet, the Western alphabet, that was fine. Well, what about for all the other characters and all the other alphabets around the world? And so to encode, uh, have a coding scheme that worked for all of the other letters of all the other alphabets in the world, Unicode was created. And so Unicode is variable length encoding. And so it could use anywhere from one to four bytes. So it could use, you know, just eight bits or it could use up to 32 bits, right? A byte is eight bits. And it, it just depends. And so the first part of Unicode is ASCII. And if you scroll down here, you start seeing ASCII stuff. And interestingly, as you go through this, you could see here, here's the position in hexadecimal, the position, the number, the representation in hexadecimal, and here's the representation in decimal. And so, right, at the very beginning, it's all the same, because if you think about our numeral systems, right, here's the ones place for hexadecimal, and here's the ones place for decimal. And so we're just saying one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ones, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ones in either of them. And so each of them, right, we're seeing one, two, you know, these numbers are matching, three, four, 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 five, five, and then we get to nine, nine. And then here we go to, well, now with decimal, we're going to have one in the tens place and zero in the ones place, right? So we have one in the tens place and zero in the, in, in the ones place. But with hexadecimal, we're still here because it's base 16, and we go from nine to A. Right, so there is there is the decimal equivalent of ten in hexadecimal is just capital is just a right there, right? It's just a, and so you can see that representation. But then if we get back up here to the letter capital G, and the letter capital G right here is seventy one. That's exactly the same as the letter capital G in ASCII, which right here capital G. Come on, where are you? <laughs> capital G is right there, and it's seventy one in decimal, right? Right there. So the first part of Unicode. 71 capital G is ASCII, 71 capital G, right? And so then we have those two coding schemes. Those are our two coding schemes. And, uh, and I have this here in a little comment, and you could read about it. ASCII is the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. It was a one-byte coding scheme, so you could have 256 unique values. Unicode is a four-byte uh, coding scheme, 
So you could have 4 billion, 294 million <laughs> unique values, which is more than enough to count for every character in every language, including a lot of emojis. And then we have UTF-8, right? And UTF-8 is, um, is the way that, uh, you know, Unicode is stored as binary. And so it's a variable length encoding, right? Which leads to efficient memory use. And if a character needs only one byte, that's all it uses. And if it needs four bytes, it'll use four bytes. And common characters like C take eight, eight bits, right? One byte. But rare characters like an emoji will take four bytes or 32 bits. And so other characters could take 16 to 24 bits. And so that's the relationship between ASCII, Unicode, and UTF-8. Good to know. And Go uses Unicode and UTF-8, and that's why you could print out emojis like this when you're printing stuff in Go. And just as a cool little thing to know, when you're working in Go, you could press Start. If you're on Windows, press the Start Windows key and a period, and you could search for emojis, and you could add stuff in just right there. It's pretty amazing. Uh, next thing we're going to see is, uh, so when we print that out right here, I just ran this already, so you wouldn't have to see me switch between directories. But there's the output of uh, that first pro program. And then here is our next program, and the output of our next program is right here. And so the first thing we do is we print G and then an emoji smiley cool guy. And so we're printing out that string right there. And it's good to go to the standard documentation. And let me just do a little bit of a cleanup here. Uh, so, we, okay, so here we go. So it's standard documentation. I'm just going to search for a string here, and we'll take a look at what the definition of a string is in uh, the standard definition uh, in, the, in, the, in the language specification. So a string type represents a set of string values. A string value is a possibly empty sequence of bytes. The number of bytes is called the length of the string, and is ne so the, the number of bytes is the length, right? And uh, the length of a string can be discovered using the built-in function length. And so, uh, you know, that's that's the definition of a string, but you'll also hear runes used when people are talking about strings. And so if you go and you take a look at rune literals, here's a little bit about rune literals, but effective Go actually has a really nice uh, definition of a rune. And it says a rune in Go terminology is Go terminology for a single Unicode code point. And so if we look at this in our code and we say length, we get the number of bytes. So when I ask for the length of this right here, I'm going to get five. <laughs> and so, uh, and here's the length right here. It gives me five <laughs> because this character here, the G is one byte. And then th that took eight bits, right? To store the G, it's just the number 71. And then this one here took four, took four bytes. And so we have five bytes there, which is what length gives us. And if you want to count the runes or the characters, and if you remember, here in Effective Go, a rune is Go terminology for a single Unicode code point. If you want to count each, and so you could just think of a rune as like a character. <laughs> if you want to count the runes in, in that, that's going to give us two, right? So when I do the rune count and look at my output, uh, we have two characters or two runes right there. And then just also nice to know is you could access each of the, the characters right there, like, you know, uh, you know, using this notation right there. And so we could just do that notation to get to the first character, that notation there to get to the second character. And we could also range over that uh, slice of uh, runes right there, and we could get the output right here. And we'll get those outputs right there as the index position, index zero, uh, and that's 71 for capital G and index one. And then that's the decimal number for uh, this cool guy emoji right there. So that's a little bit about runes. Uh, it's a little bit about, uh, you know, ASCII, Unicode, and UTF-8. In the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to um, do this right here. Let me just scroll up to it. We're going to do a palindrome challenge, and so uh, we're going to just test to see if something's a palindrome, and uh, that's going to be super cool, and you're going to be able to contribute your solution so other people can see it, and we're not looking, I'll explain it in the next one. But if you want to see that next video, hit the subscribe button so you're notified when it comes out. And then also, if you enjoyed this video, hit like and leave a comment down below. I love hearing from people. And if you have any code you want to contribute, go to the GoLang Playground, go to Lang Playground, and you can type up some code to illustrate stuff and leave a comment explaining it. And, uh, and then come up here to share and grab your code and drop it into the comments down below. And then other people will be able to see the code. And then we have this dialogue going on. That's kind of cool. So hit that subscribe button, hit like, leave a comment, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>